square one module eight. In this module, we're gonna talk all about exercise and rest, two components of health that go hand in hand. In Western nations, we don't get enough exercise and we don't get enough rest. I know that sounds contradictory. If we're not exercising a lot, then we must be resting a lot, right? Wrong. If you look at the way we're living in westernized, industrialized countries, we are too sedentary. We're seated for most of our lives. We sit down to eat breakfast. We sit to travel to work. We sit at work, most of us. We sit on the way home from work. We sit down to eat lunch and dinner. And then we sit in front of the TV or the computer until we go to bed. The populations around the world with much lower rates of cancer are also much more active. Movement is life. You need to move. You need to be in motion. When you're in motion, you are circulating your blood and lymphatic system. But if you're sedentary all day, your heart rate is gonna be low. Your heart is not gonna beat as many times, which means your blood is not gonna circulate throughout your body as many times as it would if you were active throughout the day. The first principle of exercise is you just need to move more. Cultures that move more have better health. And I wanna get you excited about exercise and movement, so I'm gonna start with a few studies that will show you how incredible exercise is for cancer prevention. Food is simple. Diet and exercise are key components of health. Eating an organic, whole food, plant-based diet and moving your body are the two most important things you should do first before you spend a bunch of money on supplements and alternative therapies. So you need to move more every day. And the latest research has shown that movement throughout the day is actually more beneficial than going to the gym for 30 minutes or an hour once a day. So this may involve tweaking your routine so that you can move more. Some easy examples to start with, walk or bike to work. If you drive to work, park at the far end of the parking lot, which will force you to walk a little more every day. Do the same thing when you go to the grocery store or go shopping. It's funny how people will circle the lot for five minutes just to get a parking space close to the door. Parking at the back of the lot not only gets you more exercise, but it also protects your car from scratches and dings. So that's a pro tip. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Now, if you work on the hundredth floor in a high rise building, then you may only want to take the stairs halfway. I'm kidding. But why not take the stairs up a few flights and then take the elevator the rest of the way? Being sedentary for hours at a time is now considered so unhealthy that experts now believe that sitting is the new smoking. Here's the remedy. Set a reminder on your phone and every hour or so, get up from your desk and take a lap around the office for five minutes. Walk around the building, go up and down a few flights of stairs, whatever. This will increase your blood and lymph circulation and clear your head. Another option is a stand-up desk. So you can order a stand-up desk converter kit on Amazon, which is a platform that you put on top of your normal desk. And you can set your laptop or your mouse and keyboard on it and work standing up some of the time. That's what I do. They also sell adjustable desks now that you can easily raise and lower to work sitting down or standing up. Even better is a treadmill desk. Some of you may have seen my interview with Dr. Michael Greger. He walks 16 miles a day working from his treadmill desk. There are companies that sell treadmill desks, but you can also just buy a used treadmill somewhere and then add a platform or a shelf to it for your computer or laptop. Just be creative and come up with some ways that you can incorporate more movement into your workday. You need increased movement throughout the day and you need deliberate exercise. Moderate aerobic exercise six days a week, like walking, short runs, bike riding, yoga, dancing, karate, wrestling, jumping on a rebounder or a trampoline, whatever you enjoy. Exercise boosts your T cell production and improves your immune function. It increases oxygenation of your tissues, it improves the function of antioxidant enzymes, and it triggers the release of endorphins that make you feel good. Exercise also combats the loss of muscle tissue and bone mass. So if you're a cancer patient or elderly, 
Exercise will keep your muscles and bones strong. The best way to prevent osteoporosis, weak bones, is not by taking calcium. You don't need more calcium. You need to stress your bones. You've heard the expression, use it or lose it, right? Well, one of the reasons that older people get brittle bones is because they stop doing physical work. They become less physically active. Lifting heavy weight sends signals to your body to strengthen your muscles and bones. Whatever is heavy for you is a good weight to lift. Some of the best weightlifting exercises are the deadlift, which is lifting weight straight off the ground on a bar, the bench press, the overhead press, the row, and the squat or the leg press. These are simple weight training movements you can do on a machine in any gym. And if you're not accustomed to going to the gym, it's okay. There are trainers there that can help you. Just tell them you wanna do a few sets of heavy weight. Heavy enough that you can only do around five reps. And they will help you find the appropriate weight so you don't injure yourself. When you exercise, you're sending signals to your body to live, to get healthier and stronger. And increased circulation speeds up the healing process. So you need increased circulation, not just blood circulation, which provides oxygen and nutrients to your body, but lymphatic circulation, which carries metabolic waste away from your tissues. Diet and exercise affect your genes. They literally turn your good genes on and your bad genes off. There's a famous Finnish study done on twins. And this study showed that exercise reduced mortality, that's death, by 66% on the twins that exercised versus the twin counterparts that didn't. Genetics had nothing to do with it. It was all about their lifestyle choices. There's another well-known study which found that breast cancer patients who walked 30 minutes a day and ate five or more servings of fruits and vegetables per day had half the risk of recurrence after nine years compared to patients who didn't exercise as much or eat as many fruits and vegetables. Repeat, 30 minutes of walking a day and five or more servings of fruits and vegetables resulted in a 50% decreased risk of cancer recurrence after nine years. That's incredible. Anybody can do that. You can do that. In a 2014 study of over 4,600 Swedish men with early stage prostate cancer, the men who walked or biked every day for 20 minutes or more had a 30% decreased risk of dying from prostate cancer and a 30% lower risk of dying from any other cause compared to the men who were less active. Another 2014 study published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology found that colon cancer patients who exercised seven hours a week or more, that's about an hour a day, were 31% less likely to die from any cause than those who didn't exercise at all. The study also found that patients who averaged five hours of TV watching per day were 22% more likely to die than those who watch less than two hours of TV per day. Kill your television before it kills you. Now, the best exercise for your immune system is rebounding. That's jumping up and down on a trampoline. If you don't know what a rebounder is, it's a small one-person trampoline, but big trampolines are fine too. I made a video about this years ago that you can watch at crispycancer.com forward slash rebounding. Rebounding is the best way to move your lymphatic system. Anyone can do it, and you can do it for a long time without getting tired because it only requires a gentle bouncing motion where your feet don't even leave the mat. Your lymphatic system is a series of one-way valves, and it only moves when you move. That's why movement is so important to detoxification because your lymph system doesn't have a pump like your cardiovascular system. So when you're sedentary, it's not moving very much. But when you're walking, when you're doing physical work, when you're picking things up, when you're putting things down, every muscle contraction in your body moves your lymphatic system, even breathing. And deep breathing moves your lymph system more than shallow breathing. 
So moving your lymph is key. If you have cancer or you want to prevent it, you need to create daily habits that keep you in motion. And you need 30 to 60 minutes a day of deliberate aerobic exercise. But it doesn't have to be in one block. You can break it up any way you want. You could rebound 10 to 20 minutes in the morning, 10 to 20 minutes around lunchtime, if you're home, and another 10 to 20 minutes in the evening, and another 10 to 20 minutes before bed. Do it while you're watching TV instead of sitting on the couch. Just gently bounce on the rebounder. I love to take my rebounder outside and do it in the fresh air and sunshine when the weather's nice. The brand I've used since 2004 is called Rebound Air. It was founded by Al Carter, the pioneer of rebounding back in the 1970s. If you don't have a rebounder or if you can't afford one, just walk. Walk for 10 to 20 minutes, two or three or four times a day, and try to incorporate some light running if you can. Run a little bit and walk a little bit, or ride your bike, join a fitness class, do yoga, Zumba, jazzercise, any kind of activity where you're moving your body, increasing your heart rate, sweating and breathing hard is wonderful. There are no rules here. You just need to find something you enjoy and do it every day. This also includes swimming, but stay away from chlorinated pools. Chlorine is toxic, but if you can find a saltwater pool to swim in or the ocean or a clean lake or river, that would be preferable. Now, there can be too much of a good thing. Extreme exercise can produce excess amounts of stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, which can suppress your immune function and increase your risk of infections or illnesses like cold, flu, etc. Running for two and a half hours straight drops your natural killer cell count by about 50%. This is why marathon runners are six times more likely to become ill after a race because of the immunosuppression. Extreme exercise creates excessive catabolic stress, which means more free radicals and more cell damage. It depletes your antioxidants, suppresses your immunity, and breaks down muscle tissue. So take it easy. Don't start bodybuilding. Now, I've been doing CrossFit type exercise for over five years, but for a cancer patient, that may be too extreme in the beginning. Strength training can be good, but if you're competitive and you push yourself too hard, you'll end up in a depleted, drained, and overtrained state. Getting a little bit sore is okay from time to time, but don't get so sore that you can barely move the next day. That may be counterproductive. If you're trying to heal cancer, you don't wanna divert your body's energy to repairing strained and stressed muscles when it needs to be focused on breaking down tumors. Hopefully that makes sense to you. Again, if you're moving every day, if you're running, doing yoga and walking, rebounding, doing all these wonderful things, and you're in motion throughout the day, that's ideal. Beyond that, if you wanna to go to the gym a few times a week to lift weights, it should be fine. Just keep in mind, extreme exercise can suppress your immune system for up to 72 hours after an intense, long workout. So don't overdo it. Just be consistent and keep moving your body. Like I said before, movement is life. Exercise switches on cancer protective genes and switches off cancer promoting genes. Exercise improves your immune function and it improves your mood. Studies have shown that exercise works as well or better than some antidepressant drugs. Exercise is so good for you. You need to do it every day. Now let's talk about the flip side, which is rest. You need a lot of rest and you need good quality sleep because sleep deprivation suppresses your immune system and you need a strong immune system to get well and stay well. Your diet, exercise, and sleep habits are critical to having a strong immune system. While you're sleeping, your body produces hormones that help fight infections. A study at Carnegie Mellon University found that healthy men and women who slept less than seven hours a night were three times more likely to develop cold symptoms after they were exposed to a cold-causing virus when compared to people who slept eight hours or more. Most people need eight to 10 hours of sleep every night, and you need to go to bed earlier. Think about our ancestors. 
Our ancestors often went to sleep a few hours after sundown, and they slept less in the summer and more in the winter. They were in harmony with nature. They were in tune with the cycle of the sun. When the sun rises, the light sends signals to your body to wake up. And when the sun sets, the darkness, the absence of light, sends signals to your body that it's time to sleep. But the problem is we live in a modern electrified world and we keep the lights on and the TV on late into the night and we keep ourselves awake when we should be sleeping. There are some people, especially type A people, who become workaholics and only sleep four to six hours a night because they are so determined to accomplish things. Granted, you will accomplish a lot more working 18 to 20 hours a day but you may die very young or get sick very early in life, and then you realize it wasn't worth it. Whoever came up with the analogy of burning the candle at both ends was a genius. You need good quality sleep, eight to 10 hours. There was a Japanese study of 24,000 women ages 40 to 79, and they found that the women who slept less than six hours a night were more likely to develop breast cancer than the women who slept longer. The 2011 Nurses Health Study from Harvard also found an increased risk of breast cancer for women who didn't get enough sleep. And a 2010 study at Case Western found an increased risk of colon cancer for people who slept less than six hours a night. Even interrupted sleep can make cancer aggressive and feed its growth. There was a study done in 2014 at the University of Chicago where they took a group of mice and interrupted their sleep every couple minutes throughout the night. The tumors on those mice grew twice as large as the tumors on the mice who slept normally without interruption. And this was after only four weeks of interrupted sleep for the mice. Keep in mind, mice have a much shorter lifespan, so four weeks to a mouse is a couple years to a human. Your tumors aren't gonna double in four weeks if you don't get good sleep, but if you sleep poorly for years, it could make you more vulnerable to cancer. Interrupted sleep causes immunosuppression. If you're a light sleeper and things are waking you up in the night, you need to make some changes to get better sleep. One solution for that is a sound machine. It's a white noise machine that sounds like a fan. We actually use an air purifier in our bedroom to clean the air and for the white noise. I also have an app on my cell phone called Sleep Pillow that I use when I travel. You need eight to 10 hours of quality uninterrupted sleep, and you need to go to sleep within a few hours of sundown. This is gonna take some getting used to because if you're used to going to sleep at midnight, it's gonna be hard to fall asleep at nine or 10 p.m. But eventually your body will get into a new routine where you can fall asleep quickly and earlier. 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. has been identified as a critical period to recharge your internal systems like your adrenal. So getting into bed around 8 or 9 and falling asleep before 10 would be ideal. Earlier is fine too. Next, you need to sleep in total darkness because light in your bedroom at night can interfere with one of the most powerful anti-cancer hormones in your body, melatonin. Melatonin is an antioxidant five times more powerful than vitamin C, and it increases the effectiveness of killer immune cells that fight off foreign invaders and cancer cells. Melatonin also increases the activity of superoxide dismutase and glutathione, which are antioxidants and detoxifiers of your body. Melatonin promotes cancer cell death in many different types of cancer cells and tumor growth is restrained by the nighttime surge of melatonin in your body. So you need the naturally produced melatonin that happens in your body when you sleep in total darkness. If you're wondering about melatonin supplements, I have yet to see research that indicates that a melatonin supplement at night has the same anti-cancer effect as naturally occurring melatonin in the body. Here are some simple steps to improve the quality of your sleep. First, you need to black out your windows. If you've got a lot of light coming in your bedroom windows, cover them with blinds or curtains. If money's tight, cover them with garbage bags. Don't use night lights and definitely don't sleep with the TV on. If 
you have an alarm clock, you might want to turn it and face it against the wall or cover it up if it's really bright. Now, there's one catch. If the sun normally wakes you up, then blacking out your windows will prevent that, so you will need to set an alarm. I normally wake up naturally without an alarm, but when I need to wake up extra early to catch a flight or whatever, then I use a sunrise alarm clock. It gets brighter and brighter gradually, like the sunrise, and it wakes you up in a really nice, gentle way, as opposed to the awful stress-inducing alarm clock buzzer or radio blaring. So I recommend you invest in a sunrise alarm clock. Just look for the brand with the best reviews on Amazon. Now let's circle back to melatonin for a second because there are a few other things that interfere with melatonin production in your body. One of them is stress. If you have a lot of worries, fears, and anxieties, they will keep you up and they will wake you up and prevent you from getting good rejuvenative sleep. You have to stop worrying about the future. I devoted an entire module to help you identify and eliminate the stress in your life that was module six, hopefully you watched it. Nighttime exercise also interferes with your body's ability to produce melatonin. So if you exercise at four or 5 p.m., you're fine. But if you exercise too late in the night, it can interfere with your ability to fall asleep and your ability to produce melatonin. Caffeine, tobacco, and alcohol also interfere with melatonin production. And there are over 700 brand name and generic drugs that are known to interact with melatonin over 700. So if you're taking any drug, whether it's prescription or over the counter, it's probably affecting your melatonin production. If you're having trouble sleeping at night and you're taking any type of medication, that may be the reason why. I'm not a doctor, this is not medical advice, but I think it's wise to get off prescription medication because most prescription drugs can only alleviate symptoms and can cause many additional problems in your body over time. But you don't want to stop taking something that's keeping your heart beating. So talk to your doctor before getting off any prescription medication. Next, take naps. Naps are an awesome way to recharge your brain and your body. Some of the healthiest people groups around the world with the longest lifespans are also nap takers. So let's follow their example and take more naps as often as you feel like it. You have permission to take a nap. You're not being lazy. There's nothing wrong with you. It's a healthy practice. Whether it's 15 minutes or 45 minutes or two hours, everybody's different. Just take more naps every day if you need to. The final component in rest is taking a day of rest, taking one day a week off. This is a biblical principle that goes back to Genesis. God rested on the seventh day after creating the earth. Why did God take a day of rest? Does God need rest? No, he took a day of rest as an example to us, to show us that it was important. This is a biblical principle, and it's one of the Ten Commandments, right up there with do not commit murder. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall work, and the seventh day is a day of rest to the Lord, and you shall not do any work. That's straight from Exodus 20. The Seventh-day Adventists in Loma Linda, California are the longest living Americans. The Adventist men live seven years longer than the average Californian man, and they take a day of rest every week. They're serious about it. Their Sabbath is on a Saturday like the Orthodox Jews. You need a Sabbath day. It could be on Saturday, it could be Sunday. If you're a hairdresser, it could be Monday. You just need one day per week where you don't work, where you make yourself rest. I know this is really hard for some people, especially if you're type A, but your body and your mind need rest. You just have to do this. One day a week, do as little as possible. Don't think about work. Don't talk about work. Don't check your email. Stay off the internet if it's work related and just try to be at peace. Try to have some peace and quiet. If you're a believer, go to church, spend time with family and friends, take a nap. That's our Sunday routine and we love it. Taking a day of rest is an important component of health and healing. Do not ignore this advice. Okay, so let's